Suspected North Korean hackers have managed to perform a man-in-the-middle attack against an Indian software security company known as eScam. The man-in-the-middle attack tricks the victim's machines into communicating with a malicious update server that downloads a malicious update to the victim's machine that takes over it, installs backdoors, and in some cases, installs crypto miners to the computer as well. We have a very detailed write-up today from Avast about the malware campaign, who primarily got their details about it from machines that actually had Avast and eScan antivirus installed on them at the same time. Now, Avast has already disclosed this issue to eScan and to the Indian Computer Emergency Response Team as well before publishing this write-up, and they were able to resolve the issue for the most part. So if you're using eScan, make sure you install some updates. And also there's links in the description to tools for you to be able to scan for any indications of compromise. Now, the name of the malware that is used in this campaign is called Gupti Miner, which Avast says they've been observing strains of as early as 2018, and they believe that it's developed by Kim Suki, a North Korean state-sponsored hacking group. And they believe this because of similarities between this malware and key loggers that are known to have been developed by Kim Suki in the past, and another indication that this malware is at the very least a state-sponsored effort is just the sheer sophistication that went into its development and into its deployment. For example, the Gupti Miner hosts its own DNS servers for serving the true domains of their command and control servers via DNS text responses, and they do this in order to prevent legitimate DNS servers from seeing any of the malware's traffic and it also lets the hackers make DNS requests to whatever domains they want, like Microsoft.com or Sneakerhost.com, as we can see here. And that way they can route them to whatever IP address they want without actually having to hack Microsoft.com and turn it into a command and control server that they deliver malware payloads from. Now, it's still currently unknown how the initial compromise of victims' machines happened to allow the man-in-the-middle attack in the first place, but beyond that point, Avast gives us quite a bit of detail into what this malware does once it's on a victim's machine. So when a compromised eScan installation first triggers that update to communicate to the malicious server, a malicious package updll62.dlz is downloaded and unpacked by the eScan updater. And this package contains a malicious DLL, usually called version.dll, that is sideloaded by eScan in the first stage of the malware's deployment. Now, because of the sideloading, the DLL runs with the same privileges as the source process eScan, which has a lot of privileges on the victim's machine, and it is loaded the next time that eScan runs, usually after a system restart. If a mutex is not present in the system, which depends on the version, the malware searches for services.exe process and it injects the next stage into the first one that it can find, Cleanup is performed, removing the update package. The malicious DLL that's downloaded contains additional functions that are not present in the clean one, whose names really stuck out like a sore thumb for the most part. Uh, this x64 call acts as a helper function for running x64 code inside of a 32-bit process on a 64-bit system, which the malware needs to run the shell code that gets injected into the services.exe process depending on the operating system version. You know, this malware does different things depending on what kind of victim machine it's being run on. Uh, the malware also passes off legitimate function calls to the eScan program in order to keep its functionality intact and as to not alert the user that anything is wrong. Once the shellcode is injected into services.exe, it serves as a loader for the next stage by reading the embedded PE file in plain text format, and then it destroys the PE file's DOS header 
and it removes the embedded PE file from the original memory location altogether. Across the entire Gupti minor infection chain, every shell code which is loading and injecting PE files also manipulates the command line of the current process. And this is done by manipulating the result of get command line aw, which changes the resulted command line displayed in order to further obfuscate the malware's behavior. Over time, there were updates made to the first stage of the Gupti malware that would turn off Windows Defender, create fake signing certificates for the malware's binaries on Windows, and utilize scheduled tasks and WMI events. The malware would then communicate out to different command and control servers depending on the version of the malware. And like I said at the start of the video, since the DNS servers are malicious, the domain can be whatever the hackers want it to be. And after sending a request to the attacker's DNS servers, that server would send a text response containing an encrypted URL for a real command and control server that contains an additional payload in the form of a valid PNG file that apparently looked like a T-Mobile logo, which also had some shell code appended to the end of it containing another stage of the malware, which is much simpler than the prior stages. Pretty much it's just using gzip to decompress another bit of shell code and then execute it in a separate thread which loads the final stage of the malware that Avast is calling Puppeteer that handles the core functionality from then on. And it also does some final checks to make sure that the malware isn't being executed in any kind of sandbox or virtual machine to try and prevent analysis. Uh, and of course, the different types of sandbox checking got better during the malware's development. And different versions of Puppeteer were observed by Avast. One early on version had a very interesting approach for its persistence. First, it creates a scheduled task with the following configuration. A legitimate run DLL32.exe file is copied and renamed into DSS.exe and placed in this directory. And that file is executed from a scheduled task. The malicious DLL is placed into this directory and that file is loaded by dss.exe. The task is executed with every boot and with the highest task run level priority and the task is named and located in this directory. Then the malware copies the content of updll3.dll3 into memory and deletes the original file from disk. And then Puppeteer waits for a system shutdown to copy that file back onto the disk. So this is a really way of doing persistence and trying to avoid the file from being analyzed. But one of the downsides here is that if an unexpected shutdown were to occur, like during a power outage, then the file wouldn't be restored, right? Because it's just in memory and then it's gonna get wiped out of the computer's memory. And at that point, the puppeteer would stop working, which is probably why the hackers change their persistence model in the Gupti miner later on. And finally, we get to the other payloads, which are XMR rig, along with a monitoring process that kills the XMR rig miner if certain processes like Task Manager, TCP View, or Wireshark are ran. And again, this is to avoid anyone discovering that a crypto miner is running from their machine. And since you don't put this much effort into just putting a coin miner on someone's PC, the hackers, of course, also create a couple different backdoors, depending on the version of the malware, either relying on Putty Link or a more complicated modular backdoor that would be deployed into corporate environments that would inject itself into the MMC.exe process. 
So this is really a crazy one, guys. I mean, it always is whenever a state threat actor is involved, specifically targeting an organization, especially one like this. I mean, I personally hadn't heard of eScan before. I mean, I guess that they're mostly used in India and I'm really thinking that they must have just looked like a really good target from the North Korean hackers perspective, or maybe they specifically thought that eScan's customer base were to be good targets since they're ultimately the ones who are getting hacked, people who had this software installed on their systems. I don't think anything necessarily was compromised on eScan's part, although it's still a bit of a mystery as to how that man in the middle attack actually happened in the first place. You know, one thing that stood out to me about this is the fact that Avast was able to gather so much data about this malware campaign from the fact that there were victims that had both eScan and Avast installed on their computers at the same time. Now, if we take a look at eScan's website, it appears that eScan, like most modern antiviruses, is a real-time protection solution and not just a scanner. So what this means is eScan runs in the background on your computer with elevated privileges. It's a privilege process and it's able to inspect the memory of other applications that you're running and it can terminate them if they do something funny, right? Like if it looks like it's a virus. Um, and funny enough, antivirus programs in this way actually act like a rootkit. Uh, and so does Avast the last time that I checked. It's, um, you know, it's one of these antiviruses that's always running in the background as a privilege process. They're not just scanners that scan for indications of compromise or let you do one-off file scans for sketchy stuff that you might have downloaded, which honestly are not effective against multi-stage malware like this anyway, because the first stages of the malware are pretty much just downloading like a PNG file in this case, right? So um, that's not gonna get caught by a lot of scanners. But the reason I bring this all up is that you usually don't want to have more than one antivirus program on a system at once because they can kind of step on each other's toes. Like it's not one of these cases where um, putting them together makes them better. It's, it's actually worse, right? Putting two, it's like mixing medications. You don't want to do that with your, uh, with your antivirus. Now there are some exceptions, like I would say modern Microsoft Defender is already a pretty good antivirus by itself, but there's some antivirus programs that can run alongside it pretty well without them stepping on each other's toes. So um, yeah, you know, be careful out there, especially uh, if you're running one of these more wild configurations because from you know reading the description of the malware from Avast, it seems like when it's targeting corporate networks, it's trying to seek out Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 machines, which I believe Microsoft discontinued support for back in 2020. So, you know, they're not getting updates from Microsoft, or at least they're not getting, maybe, maybe they're getting some security updates, but they're not getting a lot of updates for them anymore. And if people are running multiple antiviruses on those systems, leads me to believe maybe their security posture isn't the best, which you don't want to combine those two things, right? Like I'm not saying you can't run server 2008 or Windows 7. I'm sure it serves uses for some things. I mean, I think uh, maybe for playing Grand Theft Auto, I remember GTA on the disc for PC, like back in the day didn't work on Windows 10 or definitely not like Windows 11 or anything past that. You need Windows 7. Um, sure, there's probably some corporate stuff too that you need like server 2008 for. Um, but yeah, definitely need to have a better security posture on those devices. And if you're just curious about more details with this malware campaign, there's a link in the description below to a vast write-up on it because it's probably a good hour-long read or so. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it to hack the algorithm and check out base.win to get awesome merch like the shirt that I'm wearing right now or accessories for your phone or laptop and save 10% automatically by paying in Monero XMR. Have a great rest of your day.